Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this simultaneous meeting of Baber District Council Cabinet and Mid Suffolk District Council Cabinet. I'm Councillor John Ward, leader of Baber District Council, and also in attendance is Councillor Susie Morley, leader of Mid Suffolk District Council. We will jointly be chairing the meeting today. However, for reasons of efficiency, I will be leading the, the items. May I remind you of some domestic arrangements? Please ensure that microphones are turned off when not in use. Please do not interrupt other speakers. If you are attending the meeting to speak and persistently interrupt the meeting, you may be asked to leave. Please remember to use the chat function only to indicate that you wish to speak and not to post comments or questions. Please note that messages in the chat panel can be viewed by people watching the live broadcast. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. The whole of the meeting will be filmed except where there are confidential or exempt items. If you make a representation to the meeting, you will be deemed to by the council to have consented to being filmed. By entering this meeting as a speaker, you are also consenting to being recorded by the council and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. The council, members of the public and the press may record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded. I will now ask the, the governance officer to carry out the introductions. Thank you, Chair. The following officers are joining us today. Strategic Director Kathy Nixon, Deputy Monitoring Officer Jan Robinson, Assistant Director for Environment and Commercial Partnerships, Cassandra Clements, the Corporate Manager for Public Realm Planning and Communities, Will Birchnell, and Professional Lead for Key Sites and Infrastructure, Christine Thurlow. In addition to the Cabinet members, we also have the following councillors today. Councillor Alastair McCraw, Councillor Robert Lindsay, Councillor Rachel Eburn, Councillor John Field, Councillor Andrew Mellon and Councillor Keith Wellham. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, can I now move to the agenda, please? Um, item one, apologies for absence. And I'll now ask the governance officer to roll call for the members present. Thank you, councillors. If you could confirm your um, attendance when I call your name. Uh, Councillor Arfi. Present. Councillor Busby. Present. Councillor Davis. Present. Councillor Holt. Present. Councillor Malvisi. Present. Councillor Osborne. Present. Councillor Parker. Present. Councillor Ward. Present. Thank you. Councillor Brewster. Councillor Brewster. Present. Thank you. Councillor Byrne. Present. I am present. Councillor Flatman. <coughs> present. Councillor Fleming. Present. Councillor Gould. Present. Councillor Haddingham. Present. Councillor Morley. Present. Councillor Richardson. Present. And Councillor Whitehead. Present. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Item two, to receive declarations of pecuniary and non-pecuniary interests by members. Are there any to declare? No. Nope. Right, item three then, paper BCA 2004, confirmation of the minutes of the meeting of the Baber Cabinet held on the 28th of September, 2020. Are there any points regarding the accuracy of these minutes? Now they're in your agenda pack on um, pages seven to 10. Nope. Well, I'm happy to propose those. May I have a seconder, please? Chairman Clive Arthur, I'll second. Thank you. Um, and I've now asked the governance officer to conduct a vote for the minutes. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Arfi. Four. Councillor Busby. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Holt. I'll abstain, I wasn't present. Councillor Malvisi. Four. Councillor Osborne. Four. Councillor Parker. Four. And Councillor Ward. Four. Thank you, Chair, that's carried. Thank you. And next is paper MCA 2004, 
confirmation of the minutes of the meeting of the mid suffolk cabinet held on the 28th of september are there any points regarding the accuracy of these minutes in which case may i have a proposal please uh, chair i will i'm happy to propose the minutes thank you council gould a seconder please and chair i'm happy to second those minutes thank you council flatman and uh, now I'd like the governance officer to conduct the vote, please. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Brewster. Uh, approve. Thank you. Councillor Byrne. Four. Councillor Flatman. Four. Councillor Fleming. Four. Councillor Gould. Four. Councillor Haddingham. Four. Councillor Morley. Four. Councillor Richardson. Four. And Councillor Whitehead. Four. Thank you, Chair. That's carried. Thank you. Next item four, paper BCA 2005, confirmation of the minutes of the meeting of the Baber Cabinet held on the 5th of October. And these are on pages 11 to 12 of your agenda pack. Are there any points regarding the accuracy of these minutes? Okay. In which case I'd like to propose them and may I have a seconder, please? I'm willing to, sec uh, to second it. Thank Chair. you, Councillor Malvisi. Thank you. And, and now um, can we have the, the vote, please? Thank you. Councillor Arfi. Four. Councillor Busby. Four. Councillor Davis. Councillor Davis. Four. Thank you. Councillor Holt. Four. Councillor Malvisi. Four. Councillor Osborne. Four. Councillor Parker. Four. Councillor Ward. Four. Thank you, Chair. It's carried. Thank you. Next is paper MCA 2005, confirmation of the minutes of the meeting of the Mid Suffolk Cabinet held on the 5th of October. And on your agenda pack, they're on pages 11 to 14. Are there any points regarding the accuracy, please? OK, may I have a proposal? Again, Chair, I'm happy to propose the minutes. Thank you, Councillor Gould. And a seconder? And again, I'm happy to promote, uh, to second the minutes. Thank Chair. you, Councillor Flatman. OK, can we have uh, the vote now, please? Thank you. Councillor Brewster? Four. Councillor Byrne? Four. Councillor Flatman? Four. Councillor Fleming? Four. Councillor Gould? Four. Councillor Haddingham? Four. Councillor Morley? Four. Councillor Richardson? Um, I should abstain as I wasn't present. Thank you. And Councillor Whitehead? Four. Thank you, Chair. That's carried. Thank you. Now, the minutes of these meetings have been confirmed and they will be signed at the next practical opportunity. Moving on to item five, to receive notification of petitions in accordance with the council's petition scheme. Do we have any? Sorry, Chair, none received. Thank you. Item six, questions by councillors. Chair, we have questions from Councillor Robert Lindsay and Councillor Daniel Pratt. Thank you. I'll now invite Councillor Lindsay to ask his questions to the Cabinet Member for the Environment. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, I've, I've got three questions, um, if I may, on the biodiversity thing. But first, just to say thanks to, um, to everyone involved. I thought it was a very positive series of meetings and clear consensus that we all wanted stuff done um and particularly to cassandra the, the the officer in charge there um so there's a lots of stuff that i really like in this report in fact all of it i really like um it was just to um there was a few bits that have seemed to be seem to be missing that we discussed so number one was um well perhaps not missing but it talks about meadow planting and I know this sounds like semantics, but I, um, I thought the thrust of our argument was that meadow planting isn't really, what we're really talking about is meadow management. Um, because if we're, if we're talking about 
planting up meadows it often means spraying a load of glyphosate to kill off the grass that's there and you actually lose some biodiversity potentially by doing that far better to manage it by mowing less frequently and taking the cuttings so I, that was just a plea can we change the wording to meadow management when we talk about that that was number one and number two was um that the, I didn't see anything about, I thought we discussed about removing glyphosate 100% from council use. Um, and I and I think we should do that. And I think we should also publicise the fact that we're doing it if we want to encourage um, farmers and, uh, non, and, and domestic users of glyphosate to stop using it. So um, uh, what's happened to the, the plan to phase out glyphosate? And do we have a plan to publicise the fact we're doing it? That was number two. And number three, um, we heard about the, all the work that was done with the hedgerow survey and there were plans to digitise it. But what's happened with those plans? Is there a timetable or someone assigned to, to digitise the hedgerow survey? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lindsay. Councillor Malvisi, would you like to respond? Thank you. With regard to the if I pronounce it correctly, glyco glyphosate. Glyco I still can't Glyphos do it. Glyphosate. Yeah. Glyphosate. That's it. Okay. Um we are reducing its use. In fact, I'm not sure that we actually use it at all anymore. Um I think I'll call on Cassandra Clements to confirm that, please. Hello there. Yes, so um, we spoke to the Biodiversity uh, Task Force about the use of um, glyphosate. Nearly got my tongue twisted then as well. Um, and it was actually uh, very low litres of it used within the council. And we absolutely did agree, Councillor Lindsay, that we would stop using glyphosate across both districts. Um, so there has been a short trial of another um Another weed killer, uh, which I know uh, Will Birchnell's on the call as well, if you wanted some further detail during Cabinet on that. Uh, that's all been working brilliantly. That's an acid based weed killer. And so uh, we are ready to push ahead now with um, removing glyphosate completely from both districts and absolutely agree that we should do some great PR on that. So, uh, I'm, can, can I just quickly ask, I didn't catch it was a something based weed killer. I didn't catch the word. It's it a acetic acid. acid. An acid based weed killer. An acid based weed killer. Okay. Thank you. Robert. It, I a, think it's based on acetic acid. Acetic it's acid. Vinegar. 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 Yes, okay. vinegar. Yes, vinegar. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So when okay. instead of putting it on your chips, you go out and put it on your weeds. Yummy. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the other two questions. Yeah. On the meadow planting. Um, we were talking about meadow verges, not actually creating meadows per se. Yeah, so my, my, the same question applies really, because if you manage the verges with by uh, removing the cuttings, and uh, there's not necessarily a need to replant, is what I'm saying. No, but, then, but we wouldn't be using glyphosate did i get that right uh, we wouldn't be using glyphosate to reduce the grasses in order to be able to plant the meadow verges we'd be using the acetic acid which is the vinegar and removing i mean if if the timing is right you get the grasses cut down and then removed and then you plant the the um was they call them flowers for bees or something that's being advertised, and then you you know that generates your um, your meadow verge. Um, Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't want to hold everyone up, but it's just I think it's not necessary. It, it's not in every situation. It's not necessary. I wouldn't have thought to actually remove the vegetation that's there. No, that's in right. In some cases, right. you don't even need to do that. No. You may need a little bit of sowing of some some seeds, but not not a complete. You don't need to kill off what's there. And I'd have thought, as a principle, we ought to say, you know, by default we don't kill it off unless there's unless we know that 
that we can't establish that habitat any other way. But Council in order Lindsay, to gain, we, sorry. Uh, Councillor Lindsay, we'll cut and collect to re uh, gradually reduce the fertility yeah. over time. Yeah. And yes. we're, looking at, uh, we're looking at acquiring uh, a dedicated mower for that. Cassandra? Okay. Hello, okay, yeah, sorry, just thought I'd jump in and, and help a little here. Um, absolutely, the, the uh, specifics we were talking around at one point were around um, meadow verges, but uh, Councillor Lindsay is right, the, the term for um, anything of that kind is actually man meadow management. So my apologies for the, the incorrection in the, in the report. So essentially, meadow management is simply covering that um, you will look at the the nature of the piece of land and uh, act appropriately. So rather than just saying planting, because it might not be appropriate to plant, um, it's about meadow management. So I, I apologise, that's an incorrect uh, word use of, uh, from me. OK. Um, Councillor Lindsay, your next question. What was the digitisation of the, of the, the uh, hydro oh, yeah. survey? Right, well, at the... That's actually quite a long convoluted task. Um, and I think there is a consensus that perhaps we could maybe utilize the services of some students to digitize, um, but it's not been dismissed. It is there, it is planned. Um, so I hope that allays any fears that you have. Okay, we don't have a timetable then by the sound of it. No, we don't, because I think it's going to take some time to actually quantify. Um, I think it's a case of actually, I mean, as ridiculous as it sounds in 2020, we're going to have to get the boxes of the papers, count the papers and work out how long it's actually going to take to digitise. Um, so we are not dismissing it because it's invaluable information and invaluable resources once it's digitized um, but the mapping goes ahead and that hopefully will run parallel but to the side your third question i think i think we've done them all now thank you okay thank you okay thank you for that um next we'll move on to um councillor mellon uh, i believe is now going to ask questions on behalf of councillor pratt um, who's unable to attend this afternoon, and that will be to the Cabinet Member for Environment at Mid Suffolk. Um, Councillor Mellon, can you stick to the, the questions as they were um, originally submitted, please? Um, certainly can, Chair. Um, to be honest, they are pretty much identical to the questions that um, Robert Lindsay has asked, so I don't think we need to proceed with them. Okay, right. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, in, interesting questions, and I think they will help um, uh, certainly um, from the, the perspective of the um, uh, the digitising the hedgerow survey. I, I have actually heard that um, Will Birchnell will be carrying out this task um, and um, will be using the uh, Suffolk Biodiversity Information Service to, to assist and, and to um, hold that information. Uh, Cassandra, did you want to come in on that? Hello. Yes. So it's just to confirm on that last point that uh, Will Birchnell absolutely has taken the action to look into the hedgerow digitalisation surveys. Um, he is two prongs, really. We are looking at whether we can use apprentices to do that. Um, but we are also going to get a quote through Suffolk Information Services as well um, in case that doesn't come through. So there may be a cost to it, but we're hoping to be able to do that a different way. OK. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just point out at, at, at this stage, we, we must be careful not to demonise glyphosate too much. Um, the, uh, the manufacturer of the uh, acetic acid based um, alternative does actually um, quote that it's I ideal to use um, in rotation with glyphosate. And we must also realise that glyphosate um, does, it is a systemic weed killer, unlike acetic acid, which just operates on the foliage. And um, it is uh, broken down quite quickly on contact with the ground. Um, acetic acid is also only ideal for hard surfaces rather than um, uh, open countryside. And it does have a potential um, harmful impact on uh, reptiles and amphibians. So we need to 
we need to be careful on this. Uh, Councillor Fleming, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I just um, I had put my hand up um, in response to the question about the hedge survey. Um, I just wanted to add that um, we've been having conversations with Will Birchall and because this is a Suffolk wide um, set of data, we clearly need to work with our other local authority partners to get this done. And that's exactly what we intend to do. Um, how we approach getting the data out of it and digitizing it needs to be consistent across the county and the data that we get out or abstract <clears throat> needs to be in a, um, a usable and useful format so it's not something you just go for hell for leather at it needs a bit of thought and coordination and that's exactly what we're doing thank you council for me Okay, then moving on, item seven, matters referred by the Overview and Scrutiny or Joint Audit and Standards Committees. There were none, Chair. Thank you. Item eight, the forthcoming decisions list. Uh, you've all been provided with the, uh, the link to the latest uh, forthcoming decisions list. Does anyone have any comments, please? Okay, in which case we'll move on to item nine. And this is paper BCA 2006 and MCA 2006, the Biodiversity Task Force Proposals to Cabinet. Now for Baber, this is on pages 13 to 46 of your agenda pack. For Mid Suffolk, on pages 15 to 48 of your agenda pack. I'll now invite the Baber Cabinet Member for the Environment to introduce the Baber report. Councillor Malvisi. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair. Um, I am laying before cabinet a motion that the biodiversity action plan as created by the biodiversity task force be adopted by Baber. that the biodiversity task force group continue to meet to monitor the action plan and consider new ideas for increasing biodiversity some time ago you recognized the increasing pace with which our natural habitat is being decimated and that it too has now become an emergency, but a biodiversity one. Since then, the National Trust has announced they're going to fell some 40,000 trees because of ash dieback. And that by 2100, or 2100, we will have destroyed some 24%, if not more, of our wildlife. The impact of that on us or those of us left is unimaginable. The ecosystem will itself be decimated. Biodiversity for our, in our district doesn't sit in isolation. It's intrinsically intertwined into our lives and the world's, into our climate and the world's climate. You must remember as a child being told that if a butterfly flapped its wings in Beijing, then New York would have a cyclone. And that's true because the felling of trees in the Amazon forest is causing massive damage to climate and changing it globally. But if we all start doing something positive to protect and enhance our own ecosystem, then the fight back starts. It's therefore imperative that we work towards a system where we enable a net biodiversity gain. There are some who've written to the media demonstrating a lack of some pretty fundamental principles that in order to solve a problem, you have to go back to the original. You have to retrace your steps to see where it went wrong. We're all in this together. This first piece of work is only part of what's needed to be done. A joined up collective effort from everyone. And if anyone wants to contribute to the mapping, planning, delivery of Council's biodiversity aspirations, they're very welcome. We're asking you to enable us to conduct the survey that will assist us to map our nature reserves and wildlife sites. Identify the wildlife corridors that exist, which in turn will identify where we are lacking and need to focus. There are voices that ask for this map to go public public consultation, but to what end? The map is to determine what we've got, because right now we don't know what we've got. And that sounds pretty shocking. Existing wildlife corridors can be enhanced and strengthened by either reinstalling hedgerows, 
in the correct areas or by planting the correct trees again in the correct areas, thus creating an oasis of biodiversity. This map, though, will be multi-purpose since it will provide our planners with definitive data to enable them to build back better and help them make the necessary value judgments in the planning process. The map, which will be available to the public, will assist the districts to develop ecotourism, thereby attracting much needed tourist revenue to the region, which hopefully then we can plow back to develop our flower meadow verges. Changing our management techniques to stifle the growth of grasses and encourage wildflower growth. Provide habitat for bees, butterflies and other insects necessary to maintain a balanced ecosystem. The task force continues to be committed to the Trees for Life scheme, providing native, locally sourced and grown trees. Naturally, everything the task force has worked on and put into action plan could not have been done without the invaluable expertise and help from Simone Bullion of the South, South of the Suffolk Wildlife Trust, Sue Hooten of Place Services, David Hughes, Andy Graham, Martin Sanford at Suffolk Biodiversity Information Service, and last but not least, Cathy Oberton, without whom we would have got totally lost in the volume of information and data. And of course, maybe last, but most definitely not least, the never ending support from Cassandra Clements and her team. A huge thank you. It must be recognised that the cost of maintaining and improving the biodiversity of our area must be budgeted for moving forwards. The creation of a wildlife network map will allow us to quantify the effort required to improve biodiversity across the region and allow us to target funding to those areas most in need. And in agreeing, you are further endorsing the lead environmental position of both Baber and Mid Suffolk in the county of Suffolk. I recommend this motion to you. Thank you. Chair. Has everybody frozen? Uh, no, Councillor Malvisi, I don't believe so. We've uh, seem to have lost the chair. Councillor Ward? Gosh, sorry, I'm here. Yes, I don't know what happened then. Um, right. I'll put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you, Councillor Malvisi. Um, may I have a seconder from Baber? I'll be happy to second that myself. Um, and now I'll invite the Mid Suffolk Cabinet Member for the Environment to introduce the Mid Suffolk Report. Councillor Fleming. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, everybody. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. Um, I am delighted to introduce this paper, which presents the work of the Biodiversity Task Group in the form of actions designed to put into place real safeguards for the wider environment and biodiversity with it <clears throat> at its centre. In addition to the task group members and officers, the actions in it are the results of invaluable input and advice from Suffolk Wildlife Trust, um, Simon Bullion and Essex County Council's principal ecologist Sue Hooten. Without these people, the actions would not be supported by a technical proposal for ecological mapping of the standard that we have before us. We are extremely fortunate to have enjoyed their company and advice throughout the meetings and to have received a proposal that is targeted to our own specific needs. You will find the proposal from Suffolk Wildlife Trust and the Suffolk Biological Information Centre in Appendix C, and I do hope everyone's had a chance to read through it. <clears throat> it's called Understanding the District's Biodiversity Resources. The actions 
<clears throat> that are before us are important first steps to enable the districts to take the environment seriously. And by this, I mean recognizing that monetary investment and some form of restraint on human activity are necessary in order to understand and keep wild areas for species other than ourselves. No pain, no gain, so to speak. Natural resources, and by that I really mean natural capital, is finite. And in order to continue to live in a sustainable and civilized way, humans must also recognize their own limits. And I'm very pleased that perhaps for the first time, this paper commits real investment to the environment. I have just mentioned the need to understand what we've got and establish a baseline. The work that is proposed will not only do that for the districts, but also it will feed into wider work on biodiversity that is important to both SBIS and to DEFRA in defining a national baseline from which to measure net gain, one of the key tenets of the Environment Bill. You will see that one of the outcomes of the SWT work is to return data to DEFRA and to gather information on county and local wildlife sites, particularly those where information is lacking. There are over 400 sites in both districts, 23 in Baber and 31 in Mid Suffolk are severely lacking in information. Anyone who doubts that action on biodiversity is urgent should read the State of Natural Capital report issued by central government <coughs> issued earlier this year <coughs> by the Natural Capital Committee. And I, I'm going to make a couple of quotes from it. The natural environment is deteriorating. The government's first report on progress against the 25-year environmental pub plan published last year provides a long list of actions and very little evidence of improvement in the state of England's natural capital. This failure is due in large part to the lack of a baseline against which to measure progress. With reference to the biodiversity net gain measure in the Environment Bill, the NCC goes on to say, only an environmental net gain approach in planning and development will ensure that aggregate natural capital is maintained and enhanced. Here I refer to the next most important action, in my opinion, which is to work with our strategic planning <clears throat> officers and develop a supplementary planning document to strengthen the protections for the biodiversity within the planning system, introduce a local approach to achieving biodiversity net gain, pending, of course, passage of the Environment Bill into law and completion of the joint local plan. Information from the mapping work will be crucial to implementing this action. And I greatly look forward to working with our planning team and the task group on this project next year. In conclusion, a huge thank you to all those who have put their time and effort into the work to date, and in particular to Cass and her team, who has been with us throughout, and to our partners who I've just mentioned. Partnership working across Suffolk and the region will be crucial to the success of this program. And we are committed to this across the board. But to start the process, your approval is necessary today. And I ask that all cabinet members please endorse the recommendations in the cabinet report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fleming. May I have a seconder from the Suffolk, please? Uh, Councillor Byrne, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, uh, we'll now move into questions on the, the content of the paper before we move into debate. So firstly, questions from BABA members. Um, I'll go through each in turn uh, to see if you have any questions. Councillor Arthi. Um, no, thank you very much. I was part of the task force, so I've had my input. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Busby. Yeah, well, Greenways considered uh, as possible consultants for the mapping. Cass, can you pick up on that? Hello, Chair. Um, we 
we were um, talking with um, Simone Simone Bullion from um, Suffolk Wildlife Trust because of uh, some other survey work that they're doing already that we believe we can um, we can go on the back of. So we hadn't considered anybody at that point. Um, happy to absolutely look at greenways for any further survey work because I'm sure there's going to be much more. Uh, but we were hoping to um, jump in on the back of some other work that Suffolk Wildlife Trust were already doing. Thank you. I mention it because they they manage the Belstead Brook Park, which is a huge the huge green lung between Ipswich and the A14. Um, it, it would be crazy to have it, that work duplicated. I'm not certain they've got the whole place mapped, but they'll certainly know what areas what. Sure, we'll make sure that there's no duplication. We'll certainly get in touch with them. That's for sure, and we're we're very happy to be. Uh, sharing our information out as the the portfolio holders have said so I'm, I'm sure we can work with them thank you um moving down the list councillor davis do you have any questions at this no, stage? i just i just want to commend the paper i think it's an excellent piece of work i've followed it all along and um <clears throat> had very simple so i think it's uh, excellent thank you councillor holt no questions john thank you councillor malvisi well i don't suppose you've got any questions <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councillor Osborne. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, yeah, I do have a question. Um, first of all, well done to the task force. I think they've done an excellent job. I think this is a big way forward for all councillors and all officers. So well done to everybody concerned. Really positive news story. Um, my question is on page 17 of the report where it's got financial implications. It refers to Baber that it will cost 147350 and some of that is going to be coming from the HRA account. Do we know how much, have we got a, an estimation of how much is going to come from the HRA account, please? Chair, would you like me to answer? Yes, sure. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. At the moment, uh, I've been talking with uh, the Assistant Director for Housing, Gavin Fisk, on what biodiversity actions could happen within um, within the housing area. So we're at very early days for that. Um, I know they've got some huge aspirations to play a big part of this role. Um, so at the moment, we haven't got any um, plans that have got um, a financial plan to them. But absolutely, we can bring that to you as soon as we've we've developed that. Thank you, Cassandra. Can I just come back on that, Mr Chairman? And also for members of the public that are listening in, I apologise. HRA is Housing Revenue Account. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Osborne. Councillor Parker, do you have any questions? Uh, not at this stage, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you. Moving on to the Mid-Suffolk members, Councillor Brewster. Um. Yes, I, I too think this is a, a, a very essential to, to get in place. Um, however, I do have three questions. Um, the first one uh, can be on at uh, para 4.17 on page 18 of the agenda. Uh, Labour is because having 10 only 2,500 recorded trees. Seeing that these are all council owned, and I put that question to, to uh, Councillor Fleming. Um, so, um, Councillor Brewster, you faded uh, away during that, and I didn't uh, quite Councillor hear Fleming, uh, Councillor Brewster is referring to uh, paragraph 4.17. Uh, 4. Yes. On um uh page uh 18 of your report. Yeah. Yeah. and um he was asking about the numbers of trees that it refers to in in that paragraph um that i think um councillor brewster the discrepancy uh, between the baber and mid suffolk numbers that's um, right yes indeed there's a big big difference Ten. Recorded trees, you know, I, I think that must be on council owned land and um, recorded trees on council land. Just, I don't think it is yes. a terribly meaningful paragraph in terms of the relative woodedness of the two districts. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't be too upset over, over it, actually. I think there's a ready explanation somewhere. 
D does that help, or, or should we go to uh, someone in the uh, an Thank officer you. for a further explanation? Cass, can you elaborate? On the tree. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So I think there's a, a slight delay, Councillor Brewster, on your video, and so we yeah. we um, we're getting a bit of your question um, every now and again. So just to to confirm that that uh, that number is about council-owned trees only on our land, um, and also what um, what generally happens with tree counting is that clusters are quite often counted as one. So it doesn't mean there are only two and a half thousand trees, but um, often in um, in tree counting, it, it's just the way they are um, added to the mapping system. So there are likely to be more than two and a half thousand. But in terms of um, the way we uh, count for trees, that's uh, that's the number for Mid Suffolk. OK, thank you. And uh, question two. Uh, this is at the back page 24. I hope you're hearing me better now. Yes. My hearing, it, it's it's improving. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just just how much consultation on councils regarding tree planting in their areas, and how many what could prove to be quite expensive tree maintenance on those trees owned by Mid Suffolk. Um. So your, your question is, how much consultation will take place on tree planting? How much consultation on parish councils and how many have agreed to carry out what could prove to be quite expensive tree main trees owned by Mid Suffolk? OK, um, we have put out a what I would call it a, a sort of a, a testing email to all parish councils to um, so to um, gauge interest in tree and hedge planting in general and we've had responses from I would say about a quarter of the parish councils who were contacted um, with interest we have really not got farther than that because we need to get this mm -hmm. cabinet paper approved and then we intend to um, collate the results and get back to the parish councils who have expressed interest and follow up and um, be more specific about where and what they might have in mind. Um, it could be on parish council owned land. It could also be on land that the um, parish council is aware might be receptive to having additional planting and in fact you know we hope to broaden that as these actions go forward to working with farmers with other organizations such as um, CLA and NFU to try and bring farmers into the scheme as well so you know as I think we've said this is at an early stage and um, we we're going to take this forward now we do realize it's a financial commitment and the cost of tree planting you'll probably see is is the highest cost in the action list. Um, I think the district intends to maintain the trees for about a year, but it will eventually be something that communities will be willing to have to take on themselves. Does that provide better explanation? Thank you. <laughs> but yes, that's Councilor, we can't um, hear you well, at the moment. Councillor Brewster, um, we, we are having problems with your connection. OK, I'll leave the last. OK. Um, thank, thank you, Councillor Brewster. I assume you said you, you're going to. Uh, I, I did. Not ask the last question. If you could follow it up, um, Councillor Brewster, with an email, I'll, I'll respond to it. I'll take it out of meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. Uh, Councillor Councillor Brewster could turn off his incoming video and that may make the connection a bit better. Thank you, Councillor Morley. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Byrne, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I very much welcome the, the task force's action plan and it's very reassuring to see that the first proposal on the list concerns 
mapping the district's habitat assets as a basis for understanding how our wildlife habitat network might be improved and hopefully enlarged. Um, I'm sure that this poll position in the document is not necessarily a statement of priority, despite the fact that it's fairly fundamental to uh, the rest of uh, the rest of the uh, action plan. Um, partly because, as as with so many aspects of ecology, all the proposals in the action plan interlink, and it will take time for us to understand their individual contributions to the whole. Even so, the mapping component, as I say, must be close to the basis of developing that understanding. The proposal talks of collaborating with partners and with so many groups and organisations sharing the common aims of safeguarding our, our um, biodiversity. My specific question is, is there yet a working protocol for integrating what we do with the efforts of others across the county? Um, thank you very much, Councillor Byrne. Um, there is, as you know, the Suffolk Climate Change Committee. So uh, at the climate change end, um, there is a framework set up for the districts and boroughs to periodically meet, um, discuss common programmes and collaborate. Um, there is not a formal programme set up um, that is equivalent for biodiversity. It may be that biodiversity rolls into the committee that's already existed under um, the County Council Cabinet member Richard Rout. Um, I would expect that that was probably where it will go um, because there is definitely a need for collaboration and we don't want to be tripping over each other doing the same thing or um, doing things that are um, that are similar but don't quite match up and, and and that's particularly relevant to the hedge survey for instance which we discussed earlier today where it is obviously important that we collaborate across the county the data are, are um, county-wide and we need to um, address it on, on a county-wide basis i believe um will birchall has already been speaking with suffolk county council about that and about other ways we can collaborate at a county-wide basis um, there, are, there are so many ways we can and have started to collaborate, um, Councillor. For instance, I've already been speaking with um, someone from, um, as, as you probably know, the Dis and District Neighbourhood Plan about collaboration in the Upper Waveney Valley. And um, I think that, um, yes, we will be collaborating with stakeholders like Suffolk Bio Biodiversity Information Service and with Suffolk Wildlife Trust and with our district and borough partners. So absolutely, yes, it's, it's vital to the success of this program. Thank you, Councillor Fleming. Okay, Councillor Flatman, do you have any questions? Uh, just to say that, um, firstly, I welcome the report and would like to thank the task force and the officers for what they have already achieved in bringing this forward. And I know it's very early days and working with our partners is, yes, key. But also, I was really pleased to see the early engagement with the town and parish councils who have yeah. local knowledge of land and possible sites, which could be brought forward. But also, once, once this gets underway, I'd really lo love to see the schools involved. Yeah. So bring it home to their own gardens with less mowing in the summer. And perhaps we could run a competition with the parish councils and um, town councils. And perhaps there could be a prize. I don't know. It, it, it would just make them go home and say, you cannot mow, you cannot mow, you know, and they would all be doing their little bit. So I think that is yeah. something perhaps we could take forward um, later on in the um, process. I think um, that's a... Do, Councillor Flatman, that's a brilliant um, suggestion. And um, I've already been thinking that maybe we could start schools, um, you know, growing some trees from seed, some based on local seed that will obviously do well in Suffolk because they're born and raised here. And I think it would be a great way to get children, um, you know, seeing little oak trees and maybe ash trees sprouting out and, and planting them themselves. So absolutely, yes. There's lots to look forward to. Excellent, thank you. 
OK, uh, thanks for that. Uh, moving on, Councillor Gould. Yeah, Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Yeah, um, a, a couple of uh, questions, if I may. Uh, like everyone else, I very much uh, applaud uh, this report and the proposals in it, uh, not least because uh, of their immense practicality in terms they are things which are immensely, immensely doable. Uh, but there is an issue there that um, and I just wanted some reassurance, I guess, on the, on the financing of those proposals. Uh, there is a degree of interdependence uh, between uh, the councils in terms of, of delivery. And obviously it requires, I assume I'm right in thinking, that it requires the commitment of both councils to enable us uh, to fully implement uh, implement the plan. The, the second uh, is really um, a suggestion posing as a question, really. Uh, and like Councillor Flatman, I uh, applaud the uh, involvement of town and parish councils in this. And, and my point is about uh, green burial sites. Um, as you mentioned at Para 421 in the report and uh, a desire to, to seek out uh, such sites. Well, my suggestion is that uh, I Town Council has in the town cemetery uh, an area which has been uh, defined as a green burial site, but there is no there's been no investment, no ability to actually develop this site or its potential to make it suitable. But I just wanted to, to put that on the radar. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Gould. Um, yes, thank you. Is, is that in, in terms of the finance between the councils, I'm really not in a position to um, to respond on that. I, I believe that if there's a will, there's a way and um, that money will be found um, to do this work because it's important. In terms of green burial, um, I have actually had a word with our local bishop, um, the, well, the uh, Bishop Mike, and I believe there is an archdiocesan diocesan, um, nominee for such things as environment, um, improving biodiversity in graveyards and green burials. Um, I believe that he is um, on temporary leave at the moment, but I think eventually we will be able to make contact with the diocese and work uh, as one avenue to work um, you know, on that um, <clears throat> point, but um, through it, through really through any anyone who has ideas or contacts is welcome to suggest them. So, thank you, Councillor Fleming. Um, if I can just uh, come back on the the issue of the, the funding of of these items, um, Councillor Gould, that there are clearly some that uh, require the uh, cooperation of the two councils, and some which. Uh, can be considered to be items that, e that each council can effectively do on their own to a greater or lesser extent. Things such as the mapping, um, the uh, the planning, supplementary planning document, uh, the biodiversity campaign, and the um, uh, purchase of a cut and collect mower are things that we will have to do together. Um, and looking at the, the sums involved, um, although I think probably at the back of your mind um, is the Baber general fund situation, but I think we can uh, safely assume that uh, we will find the funding for those items certainly at Baber because they are essential for this to, to make progress. And um, uh, without doing that, uh, we, we won't be able to uh, achieve any of the action plans. So um, I, I think you can um, be reassured that, that those items at, at least uh, We'll be able to we'll be able to proceed with those quickly um, to to make make progress on on the action plan. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. You answered part of the question I didn't ask, but I, <laughs> I very much appreciate that. Thank you. I kind of thought that that was. <laughs> part of it, but, um, anyway, that's good. Um, moving on, Councillor Haddingham. Um, thank you. Yeah, I just want to say um, to, to Cass, you know, fantastic report. Um, but I have got one question. I'm particularly excited about the colourful verges because I think, A, you know, 
you know, we all need more beauty in our life. And um, and I think it's very achievable. And on page 48, you've got a, a list of um, where you say that they're, they're the first ones that you've identified. But I, I'd just like to know that, A, how many are you going to start with and how soon will you be able to roll it out to more um, areas? Um, thank you, Councillor Haddingham. Um, I'm hoping that when the verge cutting season begins next summer, that we will be rolling this out. Um, but we obviously need to work um, with the county council and with contractors on verges that um, aren't completely in the control of the districts. In terms of our own district owned and operated verges, um, that's not such a problem. But um, I would guess next summer we'll, we'll start to change and hopefully we'll have the um, cut and collect mower by then. Cool. So have you got, you know, you're just going to start it sort of pretty much every, like not just the ones that you've identified. Are you going to just, you know, go for the for frankly, most of um, Mid Suffolk then, are you? Well, we're going uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Cass to um, elaborate on that. Hello, thank you. So um, we we based our presentation of this on um, some case studies that the task force brought forward themselves actually on another council that have done this. And they very much um, spoke to us about doing trial sites first to make sure you know what you're doing for a season before you go ahead and roll out. So what's presented to you in Appendix E on, on 48 of your agenda pack um, are the sites that we would like to do as the trial. So we will run that for a season and then we'll be able to have some evidence evidence from that to see how it's going and what we need to do um, and then what impact that would have. So there, there may be some further equipment needed, there may be more mowers needed to, to roll out across the across the districts and we can come back to Cabinet and present that to you. But this is for one season's worth of um, trial areas. OK, cool. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Morley. Yes, thank you, Chair. I've, I've got a question. I, I suspect it's probably for Cass, but I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide. Um, on page 24 of the report, Appendix A, under the um, section on tree and hedge planting, I wonder if you could just elaborate a bit on the, the cost of the trees um, and the distinction between the actual cost of planting versus the cost of maintenance and at what point do those trees and hedgerows start to become productive in terms of, of carbon take up? I wonder if you could just elaborate on that a little bit. Thank you. Absolutely, I can. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Morley. So um, this is the Tree and Hedge Plant in Action in uh, Appendix A. And what you can see there, so the numbers are the same for both Mid Suffolk and Baber, and I've split them into two. So what you'll see is a, an amount of 72,500 for trees or hedges. Now, what I have done is base that on um, a tree costing £145, um, so a total amount of trees of 500 at 145 pounds each and that tree is a, a local tree of an age that it has an Im impact immediately so as all councillors I'm sure will absolutely know um, for instance trees for life trees are only around seven pounds each and they're very young uh, and it will take some years for them to start having an, an impact so what we've done here is pitch this in a way that in year one of this plan we plant trees that immediately have have an impact on our districts so that um, that is the cost um, of the tree itself so a capital cost and then underneath you'll see that £32,000 and that is very much about the revenue cost associated with those trees moving forward so that will include the labour of planting them in the first place but it will also include an element of inspection and maintenance on them so you have a capital cost there and a revenue cost there so, of course, that's a sliding scale. If you want younger trees, it will take a little bit longer to have an impact, but they're cheaper. That's fine. We can do that. Um, and also there may be areas that um, tree planting isn't appropriate and hedge planting might be. So this is if you think of it, this is the least you can get with that money with a big tree. Uh, but of course, that money could be spread further if you have different trees or hedges. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, can, can I just add that? Um, in terms of carbon and climate change, um, in terms of CO2 emissions, you know, trees obviously use CO2 in photosynthesis. 
but they don't have leaves all year round. So, um, you know, planting trees is wonderful and benefits the environment in an enormous number of ways. But in terms of um, combating climate change, they're probably not, um, you know, the, the number one sort of <clears throat> item on, on, the, on your agenda to um, reduce our emissions because they won't buy very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Whitehead, any questions from you? Uh, oh, yes, thank you. Um, first of all, yeah, excellent report. Uh, I too was really surprised at the contrast between the number of trees recorded in Baber and Mid Suffolk, you know, four to one ratio. Because I assume trees in the district covered by TPOs are covered within this recorded trees, as these are presumably the most important trees. And I guess by definition, they're on the record. And uh, so that's is, is that assumption correct? But also my question is, are we going to do more to encourage more trees to come under the TPO regime going forward? Um, I, I have a feeling the answer is no, but I would refer again to Cass on that. Hello there. So um, on the number of TPO trees, um, absolutely, we're here to help if anyone believes that a tree should have a TPO on them. Um, I think there is that this is a really tough one to answer because there, there are clear there is clearly um, a lot of passion out there for the trees that we have in our districts. But there is also conversely very strict criteria for a tree to meet a tree preservation order. Um, and so the amount of work it would take to go out and check every single tree to see whether it should have a, a tree preservation order on it is quite considerable. Um, what we can promise is that if people do come to us with um, uh, the thought that a tree might need a TPO, that it absolutely does get inspected and it does get inspected quickly and we can start that process. Um, but I'm not sure my colleagues in the planning service would thank me for for saying that that's a piece of work that we should start doing because it, it is incredibly difficult and and um, uh, takes a lot of time to do. Um, and I, I think it's just right for me to acknowledge that I know a lot of people have frustrations with that criteria because quite often a tree isn't in danger until it's in danger. Um, and so what I do think we need to do is make sure we get right the protocol that if someone is worried about something happening to a tree that shouldn't be, that we get that part right at the very least. Yeah. Thank you, Cass. Thank you. Thank you. Right. OK. Um, do any other members of the uh, either council present have a, any further questions that they wish to ask at this point? If so, can you indicate in in the, the chat pane? Councillor Wellham. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've got I've got three questions. Um, yeah, I can understand the need for the supplementary planning document, um, and this will be very useful in the longer term. Uh, but uh, is it not possible to make to make a start in respect of open spaces on new developments? Could planning officers be asked to seek meadows, orchards, tree planted areas and so on instead of the manicured open spaces and balancing ponds that we see on developments? There's a real opportunity to start this uh, early on with dialogue with the developers at pre-application stage. So can that be encouraged, please? Um, I've got a, a question about the uh, on page on page 27. Yeah, I was I was pleased to hear um, Councillor Flatman um, talk about schools. But is it not possible that we could get something ready for schools in the shorter term? I'm sure I'm not the only member who's asked by schools what they can do. So is there some sort of off the shelf advice that can be um, sort of downloaded or provided? Uh, um, uh, things like um, how to make a bird box, um, advice about hedgehogs and how they should be allowed to go from one garden to another, um, and perhaps wildflower areas in, in um, school gardens and even at home, ways of attracting bees and, and what fertiliser and weed killer is suitable for use and what should not be used. And the third question on page 35, I noticed that there are 600 public realm sites in Baber, but only 70 in Mid Suffolk. Um, and I wondered if that's because some of the open space in council housing areas 
uh, in Baber are classed as public realm sites, but not so in Mid Suffolk. I wonder if there's a difference in the way that that, that open space has been classified. Thank you, Councillor Wellham. Um, before I ask either uh, Councillor Fleming or Cass to respond to those three, um, I, I take the point um, that you make about schools um, and, and provision of information, but we don't want to duplicate what can be provided um, very in very good form um, elsewhere, um, whether it's through, through various uh, wildlife organisations, uh, uh, BBC or whatever. Um, we, we want to focus our, our effort and our money on uh, providing information assistance where, um, that's specific to to this particular action plan and, and, and to what we need in our districts. So I certainly don't want to be um, replicating rep, replicating advice on, on bird boxes or, or um, hedgehog habitats or whatever that um, uh, are perfectly uh, readily available elsewhere. But um, Councillor Fleming, did you want to come back to Councillor Wallen? Um, Yes, thank thank you very much, um, both of you. Um, I just like to um, I, th I think um, your point, Councillor Wallam, on developers and how we can improve um, on that score is is very well taken. We did I think we did discuss that quite a bit in our meetings, and I think um, education of um, more communication with developers early is something that we want to instigate as well, which is um, possibly even involving some of our main developers in some communication workshops on biodiversity so that they are aware before they even put in an application of what our expectation is. And, and this is something I believe we don't need an SPD to do. Um, we can do that right now and, and it's probably something we should be doing because once applications come to the committee, as, as you know, it's probably too late for all that. So more early work with developers is, is definitely one of the things we um, want to follow up and, um, and, and do better. Um, also, just educating the whole, um, the whole system. In, environmental management is, is a, is a system-based um, program. So I think everyone from, um, you know, PAs, um, officers, planners, all need to be aware that we have a biodiversity um, priority now and, and, and what that means. And I think um, we will see more active, um, proactive work going on, um, which will improve the biodiversity value of our developments immensely, because there's huge potential there. Uh, on, on schools, I, I agree with Councillor Ward, I think we don't need to duplicate and probably we have to limit what we do and focus on what we can do well. In terms of um, your comparison on page 35, I'll have to hand over to Cass probably to talk about that. And if I could uh, seamlessly pass on to Will, if, if that's possible, <laughs> uh, as I know that he's got the answer for that question. Thank you very much. Yes, Councillor Wellham. Um, the difference in uh, discrepancy in those numbers is that we've included that includes everything in Baber in open space down to the one square meter. Whereas the Mid Suffolk data, I think we started at about 100 square meters and above. Um, so we have a lot more data that we haven't applied, but it was looking at the largest areas first. Thank you. Uh, can I shall I just come back, um, Chair? The reason I asked the question and, and suggested um, we might be able to download. Um, advice we can give to schools. I just wondered whether um, somebody like Will could um, could suggest where we might find the most useful information that we as ward councillors can use when we are talking to others, rather than we all look to download something and it's all different. If mm -hmm. there is a, if there are you know, half a dozen half a dozen web sheets or uh, websites or fact sheets, that that would be useful. Um, yeah, and thank, um, thank, thanks to Will for that, that answer. So, so in Mid Suffolk, are you going to have a look at the, the smaller sites or was there a reason why you started at 100 metres upwards? I think it was just um, the initial data pack that we had. It was easiest to work with what we had, but we want to, the same with the rest of the mapping data for Baber as well. We want to try and expand it to almost to everything we've got to try and look at everything we have as a package. Thank you. Cass, did you want to come back on anything there? 
Hi, yeah, I just wanted to come back on uh, the education part and the question back to Will there. So part of the campaign that's in the action plan, um, or, or the majority of it actually, sorry, is, is very much um, geared to what are the really small things that you can do to make a difference, yes. whether that if you've got a large garden or whether you've just got a window box, there is something you can do that will absolutely positively affect the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was about making it meaningful for everybody and including everybody uh, so whether it's literally planting a 20p plant of lavender or whether it's uh, you know changing the way that you you mow your gardens uh, you could see that you had a really beneficial and important part of that so I think as part of that what we will get is some information that is available for schools and we can make sure that they see that and I think the aspiration past year one will be to look at developing further programmes that might be more curriculum um, orientated but certainly the information that we come out with in the initial campaign that's suggested in the action plan I think we'll have lots of uh, lots of things that schools could take on. Thank you. Thank you Cass. Councillor Eburn. Thank you very much um, Chair and can I I'd say um, as well thank you very much to um, everyone involved with this because I think it's really great to see a very effective, short, sharp, cross-party group producing um, such a good report. And obviously, thanks to the officers and all the other external people involved. Um, and I've got a couple of questions, but I, I can answer as well some of the questions from other members, because in, in my area, we've got eco churches running, which have done a lot of things about um, biodiversity in churchyards and um, swift projects and so on. And... Um, there's also a network of tree wardens that takes on a lot of the work of, of checking trees. Some of those are aligned to parish councils. And just in one of my parish councils, we've we've had a biodiversity committee set up um, for a while that's been looking at um, where to plant trees, where to um, improve verges and so on. So there's a lot of things I think are going on, which um, this report builds on. But my questions are with regards to the budget, I'm assuming for Mid Suffolk that comes out of the um, general fund directly and not the climate change, the money set aside for climate change initiatives. And have we looked at what the Woodland Trust grants are because they provide grants for planting trees? And then my second question is how, um, as I've said, there's a lot of work going on in, in, in um, mine and um, Councillor Wellham's ward, um, but how do we um, get included perhaps in this work sites large sites that we've got within our wards. Um, so for example, in Hawley, there's Gallusfield Wood, which was once owned by Suffolk County Council and is a very um, large area of, of land, um, um, several hectares. Um, how do we get those in to become part of this, as it were? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. OK. Um, thank you. Um, I. I think I might pass on to Cass to take the bulk of those. I, I think um, you can probably answer better. It's, it's nice to see the involvement of um, of, of the church, mm -hmm. Councillor Eburn, and um, also um, I welcome <clears throat> you know, I, I welcome your constructive comments. But Cass, can you elaborate? Absolutely. And I was going to say as well, actually, it's, it's great to hear about um, the eco churches work. I have come across that, actually. Uh, so we'll, we'll certainly take that into account. Um, and also just to say that, uh, as I understand it, the tree wardens group within Mid Suffolk is uh, held by high, in high esteem by Suffolk County Council as the best set of tree wardens in Suffolk. So I think there's a lot of learning um, that everybody can do from them because um, they clearly are a, an excellent um, group. Um, the the budget question, I'm not entirely sure um, I can answer that, but perhaps I could pass to finance portfolio holders to answer that. But if I just move on slightly to the, the grants, you're absolutely right. The Woodland Trust does have um, some grants on this. And if I could bring in Will Birchnell, um, Will did a, a lot of research on what grants were available for tree planting. And as I believe it, we didn't fit the criteria for this, but perhaps Will, could you just elaborate on why? Yeah, we um, as local authority didn't fit the um, applicant criteria for Woodland Trust, but it doesn't preclude the parishes from doing it themselves. Um, I had a good meeting this morning with members from Suffolk County Council um, to talk about all the things that we can do working together with their aspirations for tree planting as well. And there's lots of grants around at the moment 
and I'll try and collate that in our next mail out to parishes when we talk about tree and hedge planting. Thanks for that. I, I assume that was the case that we, you know, that maybe our schemes were too big or trees were too big, as it were, because um, they only provide very um, sap small saplings, let's say. So I, was, I thought that might be the case, but thank you very much for that. And I'll, I'll wait to hear back on the, the budget question. Thank yeah, you. Thank right. you Sorry, could I just um, clarify the final point there? You we were talking about other areas being involved, but I didn't quite catch that, I'm afraid. Sorry, yes, um, it was just if we've got sites um, within our ward, so um, for, um, and I mentioned when an example in my ward of a wood um, that was owned by Suffolk County Council and is now owned by the parish council. Mm -hmm. it, how is it possible to get those sort of in, included somehow or or how do we um, take on what's happening with the task force into that area, as it were? I see, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so I think that um, either through uh, the offices within the public realm team or if the uh, if it's agreed that the task force continues, I think there's absolutely uh, ways for any areas like that to be to be brought into the work of the team uh, because we are going to have to generate ongoing ideas and, and look at other areas that we can do. Things. So um, local knowledge is going to be absolutely imperative to that. So um, I would uh, be quite happy to start taking um, comments on those kind of areas now so we know uh, we can start planning ahead. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Whitehead, do you want to make any comment about the um, uh, financial implications uh, in answer to Councillor Eburn? Well, my understanding, I believe, is that the 500,000 covered both climate change and biodiversity, but mm. I would say this is not a definitive answer because I, I, I think we ought to get a bit of clarity just to go back over the notes, etc., to find to be sure about that. Okay. The other. Th that, Thank th you. Thanks for that. I can uh, see Councillor Morley nodding as well, so I suspect uh, that might be the case. Councillor McCraw, you, you, you've got a question now. Sorry double hit the button there. Uh, a couple of comments. First thing is that it's an excellent report as has been duly noted by everybody. So congratulations should go to the task force and indeed all the contributors. And there are a lot of contributors, one of whom uh, principal ones is actually an immediate neighbour of mine. So uh, I shall be congratulating that person in due course. Uh, I wanted to ask a more specific question um, along with the congratulations though. And this is about where one species uh, is clearly competing with another. And I have a specific example in mind, but the very general principle is that if uh, one species is crowding out, this is particularly true of plant life, and I'm thinking of a roadside plant that I see all the time. It's very tall, leggy, uh, with purple flowers. I believe it may be a, a species of wood mallow, um, Lavatera, but I could be wrong. I'm mm. not a horticultural expert and it strangles the pavements, it strangles everything around it. And I wonder if the uh, biodiversity is being addressed by not dealing with such infestations, because obviously if a plant becomes completely out of control, it reduces biodiversity. Uh, so road fl roadside flowers, good, but not all the same, and not if they dominate to such an extent that they kill everything else. I wonder if there's any thought being given to that. Um. Shall I say yes, something? Yes, please, Councillor Fleming. Because uh, Councillor McCraw was right with that particular example. It, it um, seeds freely and um, uh, it does, uh, once it takes a hold, it, it does um, uh, spread quite rapidly. Councillor Fleming. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, Councillor McCraw, you, you make an extremely good point um, about the fact that not all um, plant species are very welcome sometimes. I, I think it may be purple loose strife, but I'm not quite sure the one you're, you're referring to. Um, but one of the within the remit of the biodiversity group is, of course, some um, invasive species. And you know, those are a huge problem, increasing problem in England, in, in, in Britain. Um, actually, our tree wardens are exceptionally good about identifying invasive species and um, as well as plant diseases, in, invasive fungi, etc. Um, not just ash dieback, but um, tr tree wardens can be very instrumental in combating disease. So um, I, I think we need to up our game in terms of being able to identify inv invasive species when we see them. And um, I'm not sure what the answer is, but um, 
Yes, we need. They need to be controlled and removed so that our native species can thrive. Would, would you, you like a follow up? No, no, that's that's fine. It, it really, and I suspect it comes down to individual cases. Uh, we, we know at railway lines, uh, Budlia grow incredible, in great profusion, and that's fine. Butterflies, but there's the. I'm just saying that not all growth is good. Is uh, no. is an important point to remember that not um, all not all species yeah. can be considered necessarily equal. No, absolutely not. And actually, Japanese knotweed tends to be spread by railways and, and cutting um, cutting roadsides, actually, if it's around. So we have to be very careful to recognise those um, bad species when we find them. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Busby, you, you want to come back with another question, do you? Yeah, you kind of cut me off in my prime, actually. But uh, oh, looking at uh, the Appendix A, We've both got in there £32,000 for inspection. Um, I thought we ha already had in the budget about £60,000 for inspecting council trees. Is this, is this on top of the £60,000 or is it, have we lost the 60000 and this is bringing it back again? So that's one question. If Cassandra would like to answer that. Sure, would you like me to come back straight on that? So yes. this is um, in addition, uh, Councillor Busby, to the current base budget for tree inspections. So whenever we introduce tree planting, we will need to introduce an element of maintenance and inspection revenue into the base budget to support that. Otherwise, councils will just be in trouble when we come to the end of year and, and you'll see an overspend on tree maintenance and inspection. OK, uh, on to the mowing. Um, you by doing the mowing and collect, cut and collect, it's probably going to double the costs of getting the verges trimmed um, because it will take longer and they'll probably need lorries, etc., to put the cuttings in. And we use a lot of contractors out in the villages. Will they ne need to have also replacement machinery? I mean, it, I think it's quite an expensive business that we're starting here? Sure, so um, you're right. Some of these things will have an ongoing revenue impact without a doubt, but it's the um, the balance with the biodiversity impact I think is um, necessary. So this is um, for a pilot set. So that cut and collect mower that um, was it, is in within the budget for this action plan is for those trial areas. So absolutely, if we were to look to then roll that out across the districts, we would have to come back with a business case that supported exactly what that whole impact would be. Um, in terms of the collection, uh, it takes a little longer, but not as long as you think. And also part of the case study that we saw, and I'm so sorry, but the, the, um, the council has, has left my mind of who uh, spoke to us about this. Um, but they found actually that there's quite a few sites that they could use the trimmings very close to where they were cut to create new habitats. So um, it's not just a case of dumping your trimmings over the fence boundary. Clearly, they've got to be put in the right place and in the right way. But actually, um, we think that we can create a plan that means that we use so put those trimmings back into um, another place that would help. It does mean that we will need to take some away and we will have to uh, get rid of them appropriately. And that's part of that cost as well. OK, and another reason for cutting the verges is for safety reasons. Uh, often junctions are people are blindsided by tall stuff growing in the verges. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, what this will not do, it will be a full scale every verge anywhere you absolutely have to take road safety into account and you're right there is a specific amount of space back from any junction that verges have to be cut no matter what um, no matter what the habitat because of vehicle safety so all of that absolutely will be taken into account and finally could we not put a condition on uh, new developments where they we charge them a 10 pound a house or something or um, I don't believe we can do that. Um, I know what's in our power at the moment and, and speaking with my colleague Tom Barker, the Assistant Director for Planning and Sustainable Communities, he has spoken about creating in the interim an, um, an advice um, 
offer through to developers on what they could do. But absolutely what we can do as the public realm team is we are one of the consultees on all planning developments. So we can be much smarter about the advice that we give back on what could happen on developments uh, that's different to their normal um, regimes. Um, I don't believe there is the ability to put a charge on them for that. We put a charge on them for RAMs, don't we? I would have thought I mean, a developer is going to be pretty mean spirited if we say, look, you're building 100 houses. We want £10 a house, £1,000 just towards a biodiversity. I mean, what developer will say no? Well, apart from persimmon homes, perhaps, and one or two others. You couldn't uh, comment. I would have to take that away for, for comment, Councillor yeah, Bobby. I don't think we can answer that one just now. Oh, okay, thanks, Cass. Um, one final question from Councillor Mellon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick question on the, um, the cost of the trees, which was talked about earlier, um, which I think came out as a, was it a purchase cost of £145 a tree or, or did that include the, the cost of planting and everything. Um, the, the reason for the question is um, that would seem to indicate we're talking about planting much sort of larger trees um, and buying them in um, at a bigger scale. But I, I'm, I'm aware that smaller trees, um, you know, saplings, which are planted as bare root, tend to eventually outcompete um, larger planted trees. Um, and obviously they have a, a greater net sort of um, carbon uh, sequestration effect. So I'm just concerned that are we buying trees that are expensive because of their immediate um, amenity value rather than planting more smaller trees for a longer term benefit? Yes. If I could bring in uh, Will on this, because I know Will did a lot of work around what those trees are. Um, is it, what I will just say is absolutely there is this sliding scale I spoke of earlier, so it's within our gift to choose what those trees are. But Will, if perhaps you could talk in a bit more detail about why those particular trees were put forward initially. Yeah, so the, um, the £145 trees were for immediate impact, but that gets you a three metre tall tree um, in a region of sort of... Um, 10 to 12 centimetres in girth, um, um, grown in a pot, planted. And this was the way of us being able to um, put together the maximum budget figure that we wanted for trees to be planted. And then you're right, there is a sliding scale of trees and we can go smaller, but to get the, the initial immediate impact that we want, especially over a larger area, we started to specify with what we actually wanted um, and the best we could go for. Um, when you come down to hedge planting, you're talking about planting smaller whips, you use six or eight per meter, you end up sort of 10, pen, 10 pounds a meter for a linear run of hedge. But that um, initial figure of the 145 gave us the opportunity to scope what we were wanting to ask you for in terms of costs. Okay, thank you, Will. Right, um, we've now gone through the questions. Um, I'm now going to up, uh, open up for debate, but I'm conscious of the fact that uh, quite a bit of the debate has already taken place uh, throughout the questions. Um, so I will go through cabinet members to see if anyone has any further comment they wish to, to make, um, starting with the, the Baber cabinet members. Uh, Councillor Arthi, do you have anything else you want to say in the debate? Um, well, thank you. Yeah, I suppose from Baber's side of the conversation, um, we should recognise and um, be encouraged by Robert Lindsay's um, contribution earlier on. He is the, the leader of our Green Group. Um, and has been very supportive of the work of the um, cross-council, cross-party task force. And it's good to hear that he welcomes these proposals for the Biodiversity Action Plan. Um, I um, support the proposals. I will, while I'm speaking, just say Dave Busby mentioned something um, about developers and biodiversity. Just encourage him to have a look at our um, new JLP and the biodiversity policy at LP18, which if he um, reads through that, talks about measurable net gains. So I think part of what he's been talking about, although it doesn't, rem I can't remember what he said, 100 pounds of property or something, whatever it was, it doesn't talk in those terms, um, but it does talk about um, the things that we can be doing to encourage biodiversity on new development. Thanks. Okay, thank you. 
Councillor Busby, any more from you? No, only well, only just to say that as part of one of the developments that we did in Worsted, um, we asked for a chunk of land to be put aside for moving wildlife and trees too. And I guess grudgingly the, the developer accepted that. Uh, now, of course, we're arguing about how big a piece of land that is, but uh, you know, some some will do that kind of thing. Yep. Okay, thank you, Councillor Davis. Okay. Councillor Holt. Sorry, I missed that. I'm, oh, all, okay. I'm all good. Davis, yeah. Yeah. I'm all good, thanks. Okay. Councillor Holt. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, all I'd like to say really is, is something that's been touched on throughout the questions, really, and that is the costing of it all. And how we as Baber are going to find the funds for it. Um, all the all cabinet members know we have some difficult decisions lying ahead from a budgeting point of view. And as much as the plan is an excellent plan and, and well needed, um, it's got to fit in line with other priorities that we have in, in getting a budget passed. So that would be my only concern is, to, is that, um, yes, it's brilliant, it's excellent, we need it, but we do have to find the money for it. Yeah, I totally agree, Councillor Holt, um, and that will be a challenge for us to address. Um, Councillor Malvisi, any further comments from you? Castle Osborne. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, okay. And I don't have any. Okay, yeah, thank any. you. Castle Osborne. Oh yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, no, I think what I was would have said has, has already been raised, but I do share um, Councillor Holt's concerns over how we're going to finance this. Um, so yeah, I do share that concern. So, but otherwise, I think it's it's excellent. Thank you. Oh, and just to say. Um, on another point, um, I have at previous meetings raised the fact that woods around town do have some mature trees growing in their nursery that they're going to make available to Baber. Although we can't have a site visit now with the second lockdown of COVID, um, I understand from um, the officers that they will be taking us up on that offer. So that will make a little saving, be it a small one, but it will be a little saving. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Okay, thank you, Councillor Osborne. Councillor Parker. Uh, yeah, no, nothing that hasn't already been uh, raised, John. Really, I, I, you know, we, we need to um, expand this conversation around affordability for Baber, um, particularly, but uh, uh, nothing other than that at the moment. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the Mid Suffolk members, um, does uh, Councillor Brewster, do you have anything you you wish to add? I don't have anything I wish to add. Okay, Councillor Byrne. Right, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, this is a discussion, uh, discussion, debate, or um, questions? Uh, it's debate. Okay. Um, the only thing I, I, I had that I wanted to just contribute in, into the debate is just a little bit of understanding. Uh, for anybody who's concerned about it, and probably for any members of the public who are listening and watching in, uh, is, is concerned with the hedgerow survey, that um, uh, the, the, the answers to the uh, questioning at the beginning of this uh, item were not, um, not particularly uh, helpful in the sense that we didn't know what the answers were as to when they were likely to be digitized, the old records. Um, the, the only thing I would add, add to that is just to um, a, a piece of information that these this was a 14 year long survey uh, mm. that started in 1998. So uh, that's why an awful lot of it um, wasn't digitized at the time. It was actually carried out by amateur botanists and, and, and farmers with, with botanical knowledge. Uh, and, and they worked along hedgerows in the field with pieces of paper, ticking off boxes, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's little wonder that 14 years worth of paper records are going to take a very long time to digitize. And um, uh, we, we have to 
accept that, I think. That's the only bit of information I wanted to add to that one. Thank you, Councillor Byrne. Councillor Flatman. Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Nothing else to add. Thank you. Councillor Fleming. Nothing further to add. Thank you. Councillor Gould. Uh, nothing further for me. Thank you. Councillor Haddingham. Nothing further. I'm very happy to support this. Thank you. Councillor Morley. Yes, I've got something I'd like to add, uh, Chair. Thank you. Um, when I when I first moved into into Suffolk, um, the first thing that I did was plant over a thousand trees and hedgerow plants um, throughout my my plot, and um, then I had to wait 15 years before any of the trees were tall enough in order to install my my owl box. But um, once I installed my owl box in the first season, I had a breeding pair in there, and so. Our, our biodiversity is so fundamental to our enjoyment of our places and where we live. Um, I've got pipistrelle bats who live inside my home. I even had turtle doves in the garden, which are an endangered species. So I am so fully supportive of all this um, uh, actions in this action plan. Uh, the only thing I am really disappointed in is that I don't have a hedgehog. So anything we can do to encourage hedgehog, hedgehogs, um, uh, it's got to got to be a good thing. So the mapping is is so fundamentally important to to the whole action plan because that is what's going to tell us where is going to be best to concentrate all our efforts, not only our financial efforts, but also our physical efforts in, in um, moving this plan forward. Um, I fully agree with Councillor Flatman that um, schools should be involved. Um, I'm less I'm less convinced about um, some of the details that Councillor Wellham was arguing about. Uh, a website search will will tell you how to build a bug hotel or a bat box or an owl box. Um, and I, I don't. I'm not so sure that we should be involved to that level of detail, as as all that is in the public domain anyway. But I fully endorse this report, and I'd like to really thank the entire team who put this all together. It's a fantastic piece of work, and I'm going to be voting for it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Morley. Councillor Whitehead. Nothing further to add, Chair. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, councillors. Um, I, I'll just uh, reiterate what everyone said. That it, it is an excellent piece of work, and everyone involved um, has has done a really, really good job. Um, we've got uh, an action um, plan um, here. Sorry, Councillor Ward, may I just interrupt a minute? I think you've missed out Councillor Richardson. Richardson. I'm sorry he's not on my list for some reason. Councillor Richardson. That's no problem. Thank you, Chair. Sorry about um, that. <laughs> no worries. No, I, I'm just um, reading through my um, crib sheet here, and, and you're not you're not down. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got I've got a couple of um, points I would like to make, but I yes, will be um, brief because I know obviously we've been talking for quite some yeah. time. Um, firstly, I just want to say I completely agree with what Councillor Morley's just said. Um, I think this is a really important document, and it's as a wider piece of work. I think it's really significant for. Um, Mid Suffolk in particular. I think when I think about Suffolk and Mid Suffolk in particular, I do think it's synonymous with the beautiful countryside, those green open spaces. So I think this is absolutely integral to sort of our identity as a as a community. So I think it's really important. But whilst there's obviously this document has plenty of merits just on a pure standalone basis, I think actually what's really important is the way in which it's integrated with the other strategic priorities we have within our corporate plan. Um, so for example, if I can give um, a couple of instances. There's the um, ability for um, planning to draw on the accurate information that we will have as part of this mapping to then be able to make better judgments about some of the development sites that they're considering. Um, and I do think we, we can um, work with the developers much more in the future in terms of increasing the biodiversity and the green open spaces within developments that we see in the future. Um, ecotourism is, an, is another one, encouraging people to go out and visit these, these beautiful places. Um, and I think that's particularly ties in very nicely with um, the new facilities at Needham Lakes as well. So I think that's a sort of a brilliant example of our different um, strategic priorities working hand in hand. Um, but obviously the, the one 
big thing I want to talk about is um, well-being and how important this is for that particular part of our um, corporate plan because as there are so many ways that you can measure general health and well-being and access to um, open spaces in the open countryside. There was a, a study I was just reading over the weekend um, in the Netherlands that showed for every 10% increase in exposure to green spaces, that translates into a reduction of five years in terms of um, in terms of sort of expected health problems. So that's not um, an extra five years in terms of overall life expectancy, but a five year sort of reduction in the period where you would have health problems. And that's sort of derived from the better, the more exercise you get, just a simple exposure to vitamin D, but also mental health as well. Um, because there's also research um, in a growing sci scientific field, which I wasn't aware of previously, called ecotherapy, um, that shows that there is actually a strong connection between time spent in nature and around um, wildlife and then reduced stress, anxiety and depression. Um, but again, just touching on what Councillor Flatman said as well, a really important, important point about schools, that in terms of in, um, improving people's physical health, there's actually a really strong link between um, access to nature and to green open spaces and to, to that kind of immersion in the countryside and exercise, and then reduced levels of obesity in, in children and young people as well, which I think is a really important part of what will become our wellbeing um, strategy going forward. So I think this is a, although it doesn't directly touch on wellbeing necessarily, I think we should point out there are in numerous um, additional benefits as part of this um, this piece of work. So I really welcome that and we'll be absolutely voting in favour of it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Richardson. And uh, yes, uh, from, from my point of view, uh, I reckon what everyone said, it's it's a, a really good um, starting point, this document. We've got um, some very good actions here um, and certainly something that, um, uh, as Councillor Gould has said, is uh, eminently doable and which can be built on. Um, the, the the point that uh, Councillor Flatman made about schools and uh, getting them involved and Councillor Fleming uh, supported to, in terms of planting seeds, I think will help certainly um, uh, with regard to trees. Um, the, the children can can watch them grow right from, from scratch and plant acorns, uh, beech, um, hazel. I'm not so sure about ash at the moment with ash dieback, but um, uh, the the issue about um, uh, trees, three metre trees for an immediate impact. Um, I think is is a bit problematic because the the, the cost is is that much greater. And, and Councillor Mellon is right. Um, planting smaller trees, uh, they they do uh, quite rapidly overtake uh, the larger ones um, uh, because the smaller ones, once they're established, um, can can uh, race away and, and grow quite quickly. So um, uh, we we do need to look at that. And um, as, as uh, likewise with Councillor Morley, I've, I've planted quite a lot of hedgerow here uh, a number of years ago, about 15 years ago. Um, uh, 18 inch whips soon mature in, into um, a, a very good um, and wildlife rich uh, hedgerow. So there's a huge amount of benefit to be gained from that. Um, from, from the Baber perspective, um, obviously the, the, the cost implications of this um, are problematic and we'll have to look at it in, as part of our overall budget setting for next year. Some of these items um, uh, are, are affordable with, with um, uh, use of our transformation fund and, and we certainly do need to go ahead with. The, the big one, the, the, um, the, the tree budget is, is the most problematic and we probably need to look at um, uh, imaginative ways of trying to undertake tree and, and certainly hedge planting um, uh, there's, uh, I think, greater biodiversity value from from hedges than, than from from trees, perhaps. But um, we, we need to look at that. But um, we, we've got something uh, really good to, to go on. And finally, um, a green burial site. Uh, I, I, I think that's an excellent idea if we can get one uh, or, or maybe two in in the districts. Um, uh, it's, it's something that. Um, uh, from a personal level, I, I, I think I, I'd find attractive, although I, I don't particularly want to take up occupancy for, for quite a number of years yet. But um, I, I think uh, this, this excellent document and probably time we move to the vote. So um, can I ask the governance officer to conduct the vote, please? Chair, may I just confirm that we've had a seconder for each? Uh, yeah, I seconded yes, for... Yes, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's my apologies. I yep. have noted it down. Yep. OK, so, councillors, if um, you could answer with four against or abstain when I call your name. Uh, Councillor Arfi. Four. 
Councillor Busby? Four, if we can find the money. Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Holt? Four, if we can find the money. Councillor Malvisi? Four. Councillor Osborne? Four, dependent on the budget. Councillor Parker? Four. And Councillor Ward? Four. Thank you. And, Chair, I, do, and I do take on board my colleagues' comments about the budget. OK. Councillor Brewster. Four. Councillor Byrne. Four. Councillor Flatman. Four. Councillor Fleming. Four. Councillor Gould. Four. Councillor Haddingham. Four. Councillor Morley. Four. Councillor Richardson. Four. Councillor Whitehead. Four. Thank you, Chair. That's unanimous. Thank you. Right. Um, let's move on to item 10, which is paper BCA 2007, the infra infrastructure funding statement for Baber District Council, April 2019 to March 2020, and paper MCA 2007, the infrastructure funding statement for Mid Suffolk District Council, April 2019 to March 2020. Now, these are on pages 47 to 132 for Baber and 49 to 134 for Mid Suffolk. I'll now invite the Baber Cabinet Member for Planning to introduce the Baber report. Councillor Arthi. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. OK. Um, this is basically the same paper, paper going to both councils. So Councillor Byrne has asked that Mid Suffolk um, Cabinet listen attentively, that's his word, attentively, so that his introduction doesn't have to be any longer than absolutely necessary. Um, as a result of last year's changes to the SIL regulations, we are now required to publish an annual infrastructure funding statement. In simple terms, this return to the government says what we have collected and what we've done with the money. It is for submission to government and will be published on the Council's website. The IFS is in two parts. Appendix A deals with collection and expenditure and Appendix B with the delivery of infrastructure projects. The infrastructure list in B replaces the document you will be familiar with up to now as being our SIL position statement. You'll also be familiar with the type of information and data included as this has been provided to Cabinet through regular and detailed updates since we introduced the Community Infrastructure Levy. The headline 2019-20 figures for Baber are at paragraph 4.2 and you will see R that the total SIL income after deduction of the admin fee and neighbourhood SIL paid to parishes is £1,656,000. The total SIL expenditure is £297,000. Total Section 106 income is £382,000 and total Section 106 expenditure £150,000. The total neighbourhood SIL allocated is £326,000 and the total neighbourhood SIL spent is £23,000. I want to express my thanks to Christine Thurlow and the SIL team. As you can imagine, it has been a busy time with the new IFS, the charges and instalment reviews, which I will be presenting to Council tomorrow, and the framework review to complete before the next bid round. Christine is with us this afternoon to answer any detailed questions you may have. Chairman, I propose the recommendations in the paper at paragraphs 3.1 and 3.2, which provide for appendices A and B to be submitted to the government as our infrastructure funding statement and that they be published on our website. And I ask for a seconder. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arthi. May I have a seconder from Baber, please? I'm happy to uh, second that, John. Thank you, Councillor Holt. Right, I'll now I'd like to invite the Mid Suffolk Cabinet Member for the, uh, for Planning to introduce the Mid Suffolk report. Uh, so, Councillor Byrne, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, and thank you, Councillor Arthi, uh, for that introduction, which, um, as you 
rightly pointed out, uh, differs very little uh, from Mid Suffolk, and and in fact is uh, 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 doesn't need to say a, a, an awful lot anyway. Um, you've heard that this is the result of regulation changes that have been imposed on us uh, that we've got to um, uh, produce this um, uh, this this change in reporting and uh, those changes came in on the 1st of September 2019 and this is uh, the first year in, in or that was the first year in which we were obliged to um, uh, produce the the infrastructure funding statement. It has to be completed and submitted by the 31st of December. Um, of course, the figures in Mid Suffolk differ from those that you've just heard in 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 Baber. Uh, they're in they're in um, uh, they're in paragraph 4.2 of the report, but I will. Uh, just read them out for you. Now, the uh, the total SIL income after deduction of the admin fee and the neighbourhood still still paid out to parishes was four million eight hundred and fifty eight thousand. Total SIL expenditure. Uh, this is in the year nineteen uh, third, 2019 to twenty twenty um, was uh, three hundred and fourteen thousand. Um, Total section 106 income was 1,143,000. 106 expenditure was 389,000. And the total neighbourhood sale allocated was 848,000. And the total neighbourhood sale uh, spent was 294,000. And um, like Councillor Arthi, I would like to express my own thanks to Christine Thurlow and the SIL team, um, who I know have had an awful lot to contend with. SIL itself is not an easy uh, subject. It's uh, very complex. It's uh, full of, uh, it, 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 it needs a great deal of knowledge to understand and apply it. And uh, the team does extremely well in um, supporting any applicants, any any uh, organisations that make bids for for SIL in exploring all opportunities for uh, finding grants for them, even if uh, SIL or 106 can't 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 be used. So um, I am more than happy to propose the recommendations at 3.1 and 3.2, uh, and I ask for a seconder. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Byrne. May I have a seconder from Mid Suffolk, please? Uh, yes, Chair, I'm very happy to second the report. Um, I also would like to help the SIL, um, thank the SIL team for all their tremendously hard work they get through in delivering the SIL out to our communities, um, which is vital to provide the infrastructure and to support all the little local projects that they want to undertake. So many thanks all round. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flatman. Right, uh, I'm going to open up to questions now. Uh, firstly, questions from Baber members. Um, Councillor Arthur, I, I guess you probably haven't got any questions at this stage. Councillor Arthur? Sorry. No, I haven't got any questions. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Busby. Yeah, thank you. The demand notice, I'm looking at Appendix A, which is a fantastic document. The demand notice, um, I can't see anything in there for the, the big development in Cable. Mm. There's money collected, but there doesn't seem to be anything about a demand. Now, the demand may have gone out before, I guess, in 2008 which is why it might not be in there, I don't know. But just, is that the reason? Councillor Arthi, are you able to answer that? 
well quite plainly no i mean i could open up the sill pages and try and find it but all i'd say to councillor busby is that what we're looking at today is basically a statement of fact it's a statement of, of what happened in 2019-20 um, if you've got any detailed questions and you can't find the answer for yourself on the sill pages i'll gladly have a look for you or, or get one of the sill team to find it okay thank you Right. Councillor Davis. No, nothing to add. Very good paper. Thank you very much, Clive and the whole team. Councillor Holt. No, fine. Thank you. Councillor Malvisi. No, thank you. Councillor Osborne. No, thank you, Mr Chairman. Just to add that it is an excellent report and well done to everybody involved. Councillor Parker. Uh, yeah, I will just uh, quickly chair because um, Councillor Arthur is right. This is a statement of fact, but I've I've picked out from there. Um, it, it's sort of highlighting, and I don't know whether we should be reading anything into it or not. But with regards to the neighbourhood sill um, in Baber, three hundred and twenty six thousand pounds allocated to parishes, but only twenty two thousand spent. Um, and I think you, my very rough math is about 7% uh, that, that neighbourhoods are spent. So um, I know we're not here necessarily to discuss that, but do we read anything into that, Councillor Arthi? And is there an argument that maybe board members could be doing a lot more to encourage uh, their parishes to, to spend this money? I mean, it, it, this is a fantastic um, facility that parishes have got here. And um, uh, in your opinion, are, are we doing enough? Um, I think it's uh, uh, it's all a timing sort of issue. Um, as you know, we only started collecting about four years ago, um, and um, you you and I were both involved in the in the framework that we yeah. set up for. Puppy. Puppy. Sorry, everybody still there? Yes. Yeah. I, I can, I can um, hear so, you. Yeah. yeah. You and, you and I were involved in the framework that we, we set up. Um, with um, Neighbourhood Sill, I have to say that it, it tends to be the case in parishes that they have to receive the money before they can gather enough for their projects. So although the number is quite large, um, it's spread across the whole district. There are some parishes that have received quite a lot. Um, which has enabled them to do things. Um, there are other parishes who are, how can I put this, accumulating seal contributions and doubtless the tipping point will come where they've got enough to be able to spend on the, the infrastructure they want to provide. Um, and so as we roll through time in the next year or two, um, I'm expecting the amount of neighbourhood seal spent to, to rise significantly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arthi. Um, right, moving on to Mid Suffolk members. Uh, Councillor Brewster, do you have any questions? Uh, no, Mr Chairman, but I would say thanks to uh, what's gone on. The st funding statement is, to my mind, very well prepared. So I'd like to thank Christine and the members of her team, including the cross party. Uh, Team for all the background work that's gone on. Thank you, Councillor Brewster. So, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Byrne, um, I assume you don't have a, a question at this stage. Um, Councillor Flatman. Uh, no, nothing at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Fleming. Um, nothing to add. Thank you. Excellent report. Councillor Gould. Uh, nothing extra for me, just to share everyone's appreciation of this report and the hard work behind it. Thank you. Councillor Hanningham. Yeah, nothing for me. Like um, Peter just said, excellent work done. Okay. Councillor Morley. No questions, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Richardson, I won't forget you now. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, no questions for me at this point. Thank you. Um, and Councillor Whitehead. No, ex excellent detail report, but no questions. Thank you. Right. Do any other members um, present have any questions they wish to ask at this stage? Councillor Wellham, your hand is up. Thank you, Chair. Um, just two very quick questions, which are slightly peripheral. Um, I see the um, infrastructure uh, delivery plan is there, and it ha 
it's got one or two surprises. I just wondered um, whose responsibility it is to, um, to to communicate the contents of this to the communities, um, because there were things I, I didn't realise that there was a proposal for a Stow Upland library in there, and that was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, and I just wondered if, if if it was somebody's responsibility, perhaps the county, to um, uh, to communicate its contents to the communities. And the other is, um, do parish uh, infrastructure implementation plans still have a role to play in the in the whole seal process? Okay, thank you, Councillor Willem. Uh, Councillor Byrne, uh, are you able to answer that? I, I think the um, the infrastructure delivery plan is probably not um, something we we should be debating under this particular item. But Councillor Byrne, um, can you provide? Um, any? Well, no, I think you're right, uh, uh, Chairman. Um, it, it's, it's not a part of uh, it's not a part of this funding statement, and um, I think I'm happy to talk to Councillor while I'm outside the, the, this meeting on the subject, um, and and certainly. Um, uh, Christine Thurlow, the, uh, uh, the, the manager involved, uh, would, would certainly be able to assist him on that one. So uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Wellham, but we'll talk about it later. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Councillor Byrne. Councillor Field. Yes, um, a long report, obviously, and uh, in, in, at various points that one needs to discuss, uh, not in this meeting. Just one issue that did surprise me is down on page 124. Um, uh, there's a statement about Clayton High School and, and sporting facilities, the possible extension there. It, uh, and I know the SIL 106 for that has been around since Blake and Fields development began. So uh, we're getting close to the point where that money disappears and evaporates. And yet I was, I was surprised to find all the statements somewhat non-committal and you know, there's, there's no mention of there uh, of the cost. I did recently push the Learning Trust into producing some plans, I think, or at least uh, by, by one of their trustees. And, and there's no mention of uh, nothing there that looks like any form of progress, let's put it that way. So is that normal? It's just um, really, or should I expect not to see anything very definitive? It, we're talking about there's £200,000 available for that extension, uh, which is going to cost you know, at least four, maybe 600000 in total. So um, it's it's a major project and would have a big impact on uh, health in the, in the area. So... I, I think, Councillor Field, that probably falls into the same category of not really part of this particular paper, yeah, but um, um, uh, certainly something that, that probably needs to be followed up. Um, but uh, it, it's not really what what we're debating here to, today. Councillor Byrne, did you want to come back? Um, well, except to say that I know that uh, Christine Thurlow keeps a, a close eye on this and it, uh, we don't want any Section 106 money um, having to be paid back because we haven't used it in time. Uh, just what we can do about it in this particular instance, uh, given the, uh, the the deficit, if you like, of the total project, um, I, I, I would not be able to say, but certainly I'm sure she's she's uh, she's present at the meeting and, and she will have made a note of that and will uh, respond to it. Um, afterwards, if that's all right with you, Councillor Field. Thank you. It is, if I might just say, I think sometimes some of the bigger projects here really do need someone to pick them up and run with them. Um, uh, you know, there's large sums of cash available uh, and, and we need to make sure it doesn't escape. Uh, there's another 200,000 that goes with the one I mentioned, which could very well be convertible for this purpose. So it's something we need to pick up and make sure it gets actioned. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, um, if there are no further questions, we'll move over to the debate section. And uh, firstly, BABA members, uh, I'll go through each one of you individually if you have anything else you wish to add to uh, the discussion with this paper. Councillor Arthi. 
Um, no, thank you, Chairman. I just ask Cabinet members to support the proposals. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Busby. Well, you have just been through the education list of what's required and it comes to 40 odd million. <laughs> awful lot of money that we've got to find from somewhere. I'm not certain SIL and Section 106 is going to provide 40 million. So I don't know what the County Council are going to do. Hmm. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Arthur, did you want to respond to that? Um, I'd love to, Chairman, but I can't at the moment. Um, I was just accessing the SIL pages um, <laughs> and thinking I might have enough time to do that before you asked me. Um, I was going to um, give a figure to Councillor Busby for the total amount of SIL that we've collected so far, um, because we are talking very large numbers here. Um, and we've also um, got a whole load of SIL that's expected on approved development, which I, I don't know if Councillor Busby accesses his SIL pages at all. But whilst I've been talking, I'm just hoping that I've given somebody like Christine enough time to access the SIL pages <laughs> herself, um, and she might be able to just give us that figure. Are you there, Christine? I am, but I've struggled to get the um, the database to play ball with me, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah, OK, well, I'm struggling in just the same way, but we, we can get that answer for Councillor Busby quite simply. I mean, we're, the, the point is, um, Councillor Busby, that we, we are talking about very large amounts of money providing significant amounts of infrastructure moving forward. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Davis. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad to hear that we're providing this money for infrastructure as well, because we all know the biggest complaint we get uh, or the planning committee gets is about the infrastructure. We're building the houses, but not the infrastructure. But at the same time, I, I echo um, Councillor Busby's point about the education, because I do worry that some some um, schools, especially the academies that are supposed to be self-funding, are, are looking to dip into this pot as well. So I've got a bit of mixed feelings on that one. But overall, great paper. And that's pretty much all I want to say. Thank you. Councillor Holt. Yeah, excellent paper. Uh, I echo uh, Councillor Busby and Councillor Davis's concerns re um, the, ex the large expenditure that, we've, that we're looking at and also touching on that, that we're not the sole contributor to those projects, those type of projects either. This is a still contribution towards bigger projects which also need partners to contribute as well. Um, and, and touching on what Councillor Parker mentioned earlier, um, I think there is some some leeway in that or, or some movement in that we could give possibly possibly by sending out some sort of information like a newsletter to parishes, because I, I take Councillor Arthur's comments that perhaps they're saving for bigger projects, but there is time limits on this still money and they I'm sure most of them are aware of it, but I don't think they really are signing into it in, in as much as the money's there they need to use it and fund projects that, that are within their parishes and also we, we've touched on it as well in in, in council that Baber again as an authority need to tap into it as well a bit more wisely than perhaps we've done so in the past so I certainly think that there's a little bit of um, something we can do with with parishes to try and encourage them to use the money for certain projects and possibly think I don't know, I don't know think out of the out of the box possibly as to what they think they can do with the money. I, I think there's there's some there's some work there to be done, I think. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thanks. Chairman, could I just say, since it was mentioned again, I've accessed the um the SIL pages now. Um and if I can just give you the total figures, um the the potential column um, has got just over 15 million pounds in it um, due. So that's where work has started um, and we will be collecting. Um, that's just over four and a half million pounds. And the amount collected to date is just under six million pounds. So that just gives you an idea of the, the, the types of numbers that we're talking about. And remember that the infrastructure that we're planning for and the, the costs associated with that, they're going to be coming out of the pot. How can I put this when it's bigger than it is now? Yeah, thank you. Um, Councillor Malvisi. Thank you. No, I don't have anything to ask. Okay, 
Councillor Osborne. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yeah, just very briefly, um, I agree with perhaps the um, lack of the applications from town and parish councils, but I think also there's a, a lack of actually understanding what they can apply for. So I think when we look at this, we need to look, look at the website. I know there's an awful lot of information on the website, but is it in layman's terms for town and parish councils to understand? So I think we need to look at that as well to make sure that we are providing sufficient information and that information is um, easily understood, if you like, uh, by our town and parish clerks. Thank you, Mr Chairman. OK, thank you. Councillor Parker. Um, no, no, no um, particular um, extra points. Mate. I will just say, um, Chair, that um, I've, I've been part of the, uh, the civil working group right from the beginning and um, and it's been an absolute pleasure to to be part of something that really does deliver real, uh, real value back to communities. Um, and um, I shall continue banging the drum um, to make sure that, uh, that our parishes know about it and understand it fully. Thank you. Thank you. OK, moving on to the Mid-Suffolk members, Councillor Brewster. Uh, Mr Chair, I do sympathise with this being held by the parish councils and this um, goes to them to the 15% or the 25%. Uh, it, it does seem an awful lot still being held used and uh, obviously there is a, a but I think we could do something. Thank you councillor. Um, uh, you did break up quite a bit there but I think we got the gist of what you were trying to, to say about the um, uh, the parish council element. Um, right, uh, Council, councillor Byrne, um, I, I'm assuming uh, do you have anything further to, to contribute or, or should I move on to your colleagues? Um, thank you, thank you, Chairman. I, uh, you caught me on the hop there. I was trying to look up some information. Um, no, I don't at this stage. Uh, as 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 Councillor Arthur said, uh, this is all largely a statement of well, entirely a, a statement of fact, and it's something we have to do. So um, I'm happy that we should just get on and. Uh, yep. Uh, okay. Group. Thank you, Councillor Flatman. Um, just to say that I do know that the town and um, parish um, councils do have tra training every so often on SIL. So, and I know a lot of the clerks have been there quite a long while. So I think most of them have had the training on this. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Fleming. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I, I do think maybe the training needs to be, um, could possibly be re-looked at um, for parish councils, the, especially in the area of how they can um, pull SIL and, and uh, join together to um, bid for larger amounts of money for possibly larger projects. Um, that's all quite legitimate. I'm not sure many of them know really how to do that or communicate with each other enough. <clears throat> so there probably is a role for us to do more to, to, to help to put that money to good use. But it's, it's a really good report. And um, apart from the odd bus stop that's still in, um, it's, it's it, you know well done. Thank you. Councillor Gould. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, again, echo the comments of, of others in, in, in applauding the report and, and turning a, a very uh, complex subject in, into something that we can uh, question in the way that we, in, in the way that we are. Um, I think it, it's been interesting in terms of the uh, understanding of, uh, of uh, parishes in this and I've seen my own parishes move from uh, uh, downright cynicism when it comes to uh, the provision of infrastructure through a suspension of disbelief uh, into starting to cotton on to the fact that actually SIL is there and it is delivering uh, projects uh, for their communities and and uh, very much getting the hang of it now I think and but as, as Councillor Fleming says I think there's a role for us to play in, in, in relation to that. But um, again, applaud all of the work that, that the team does uh, and in the production of this statement, which I shall support. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haddingham. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to say that um, 
Well, I appreciate that the money is often spent in towns and key service centres. I was really pleased that Wingfield Barnes was successful in their bid because um, um, I think something like a day nursery really makes hamlets like Wingfield more um, desirable places to live and helps keep them viable. And, um, and the project will contribute directly and indirectly with our own mandate for safer, stronger and healthy communities. And um, the increased footfall um, and visitors to the site will encourage more use for the centre for arts and exercises. And, um, and the increased income will, uh, as, as a whole will make the whole thing more sustainable. And I just want to say they've already found a tenant for the nursery and, um, and the building work is due to start mid-December. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Morley. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think it's fantastic, this um, this SIL report. It, it's looking backwards, so it's all a, a statement of fact. Um, and it's very thorough, very detailed. But also on top of that, I would really like to commend to everybody our um, developer contributions database, which is online. So every councillor, whether you're a district councillor, a county councillor, parish councillor, town councillor, everybody can get on and look at the, the uh, database online and see what is available there. Um, and, and all our clerks do have training in this. It may have been a bit patchy over the last <laughs> seven or eight months for obvious reasons, but um, all the clerks have had training, they know how to use it and they know how to uh, apply for it. Um, there, there was something that somebody said earlier about SIL contributions expiring. I didn't believe that was true. Section 106 contributions are time limited, but I didn't think SIL was. So perhaps Christine Thurlow could um, clarify that outside of this meeting. Thank you. I think it's fantastic. I'm going to be supporting it. OK, thank you. Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of points, if I may. Um, firstly, just to echo what everyone else has already said um, over the course of this meeting, that it's obviously it's a fantastic report. Um, so I'm very grateful to officers who've put what is obviously an enormous amount of time and effort into this. Um, specifically, and at the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, I think some of the contributions that's within this um, document, particularly around leisure and sporting facilities, are incredibly important. Um, so just to give a few examples of what we've already supported, so extra playing fields in Mendlesham, um, play area refurbishment in Woolpit, a gym trail in Thurston, improved cricket and football facilities in, in Norton. Um, so I think that's that's a really important aspect of what SIL can actually deliver for our communities. And that sort of touches upon what I was talking about um, on the previous gender item. Um, in particular, though, I think given the year that we've had and given the fact that daily exercise was an explicit part of both the first lockdown and the current lockdown, it shows the importance of um, being able to access those sporting and leisure facilities for people's physical and um, mental health um, well-being. Um, and in particular, what I would really hope to see is because of the well-being strategy that we are going to implement as, as, as both councils, is I would like to see because we've all, I think, seen and heard anecdotal evidence around people using the lockdown as a sort of opportunity to go out and go for more walks, go for go for runs, go for, for bike rides. And I'd really like to see those sorts of trends continuing. And I think that's what we can do is, as a district council via our um, investment in infrastructure is really support people to do that. Um, and I certainly know that during after the first lockdown over the summer, I um, found myself going out cycling a lot more than I used to, um, you know, making use of, of those wonderful countryside um, scenes. Although I will confess that some of those cycle rides did involve going to and from the pub, but I like to think that was uh, doing my bit to support my local businesses as well. Um, but I think that's a really welcome aspect of, of the work that we've done. There's also one other thing which I just wanted to touch upon, um, which is a relatively small aspect of, of um, this overall report. But I think it's, it's something I care passionately about, which is um, palliative care, end of life care. So I used to work as a carer um, at St Nicholas Hospice in Bury St Edmunds. So I was really pleased to see that the one aspect of the SIL contributions was for in increased provision and specifically palliative care at Bottersdale um, Health Centre, because there's a there's been an enormous shift um, in terms of, of end-of-life um, policy over the last few years, which has deliberately tried to shift the emphasis out into the community um, because that's what, for end-of-life care patients, that's what they want. They want to be able to be cared for and to be able to ultimately die at home. So I think being able to support um, 
health and social care system do that, I think is really important. So it's not necessarily going to be the thing that we hear an awful lot about, but I think it's actually a really important bit that we can contribute to because historically, and I'm not going to go on to, into too much detail, but obviously historically palliative care has reliant has been reliant very heavily um, on the voluntary sector. So doing our bit as a as, as, a, as a local authority and, and helping our communities is something that I would really, really welcome. So I think, although that's a small point, it's one that I am quite passionate about. So for, for, for that and many other reasons, I will definitely be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Richardson. Totally agree with that. Um, Councillor Whitehead, do you have anything you wish to, to add at this stage? I'll just say, for, a, for a great, such a great amount of detail in the report, an excellent report, um, I suspect quite a few of the parishes are just taking the opportunity to build up a war chest, uh, you know, as the various small developments and windfalls come through. So we will see it spent fairly soon. And my recollection when silver was first being introduced in terms of education was that it was always going to raise quite a decent amount of money. It was always going to be a relatively modest sum relative to the total infrastructure needed, uh, you know, in the district. So yeah, every, every little helps. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Byrne, did you want to say anything more at this stage? Um, yes, I just wanted to reassure Councillor Morley that um, the conversation that uh, Councillor Friedel and myself were having uh, concerned Section 106 monies, not SIL monies being um, uh, uh, unspent uh, or unused and, and uh, on the point of having to be returned. So it wasn't still we were talking about, it was Section 106. Um, the, the other point is, and I'd like to bring um, Christine Thurlow in here, is, is uh, our, our comms strategy requires us to uh, do um, a certain number of briefings. Uh, this is in connection with um, talking to parish councils, etc. Uh, perhaps she could explain um, what exactly that strategy is and, and how we discharge it. Christine. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, our comm strategy does indeed say that we will provide uh, briefings both to members but also to uh, town and parish councils each year, uh, normally twice a year. And in the past, um, we've been very active and proactive on that front. Uh, this year, uh, things have been very busy. Obviously, COVID has interrupted um, us doing our normal thing, so to speak. But it is my intention to get on top of that and to roll out some um, virtual briefings, uh, which we can do with the parishes to refresh them on matters such as the infrastructure funding statement, all the changes that there are but also to uh, to refresh them on all matters still, because as members have identified, there is a lot of money out in the communities now, and some of the parishes are contacting us and asking for help to do uh, a PIP, which is a planning infrastructure investment plan, which identifies what infrastructure priorities the parish may have, and then we can look at how collaborative spend can achieve that or indeed to to look at some of the projects which are we're already active with with them in terms of trying to um, give them some sort of funding strategy about how to deliver what they need so uh, I'm sure looking forward um, that's something that we can put in the diaries and bring everybody up to speed on thank you okay thank you for that Christine well um that has been a, a useful debate, uh, members of the two cabinets. Um, I think I'll echo what everyone said. Great report and, and thanks as usual to Christine and the team. Uh, they, they always do a superb job uh, for us with, um, and SIL. Um, so I'll now move uh, to the vote and ask the governance officer to conduct the vote, please. Thank you, Chair. Once again, members, if I could ask you to say um, for, against or abstain when I call your name. Councillor Arfi. For. Councillor Busby. For. Councillor Davis. For. Councillor Holt. For. Councillor Malvisi. For. Councillor Osborne. For. 
Councillor Parker. Four. Councillor Ward. Four. Thank you, Chair. That's unanimous. And Mid Suffolk, Councillor Brewster. Four. Councillor Byrne. Four. Councillor Flatman. Four. Councillor Fleming. Four. Councillor Gould. Four. Councillor Haddingham. Four. Councillor Morley. Four. Councillor Richardson. Four. And Councillor Whitehead. Four. Thank you, Chair. Once again, that's unanimous. Thank you. Right, moving on to item 11. Uh, this is the resolution to exclude the public um, and that it includes the press. So to consider whether pursuant to part one of Schedule 12, 12A of the Local Government Act 1972, the public should be excluded from the meeting for the business specified below on the grounds that if the public were present during these items, it is likely that there would be the disclosure to them of exempt information as indicated against each item. The author of the report proposed to be considered in part two of the agenda is satisfied that the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. I would like to propose this. May I have a seconder from Baber, please? I'm going to second that, John. Clive. Thank you, Councillor Arthi. And uh, may I have a proposer and a seconder from Mid Suffolk? Have to propose for Mid Suffolk. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. And a um, second. I'm happy to um to suggest that. Yeah. Please. Thank you, Councillor Haddingham. Right. And uh, I now ask the governance officer to conduct the vote, please. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Arthi. Four. Councillor Busby. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Holt. Four. Councillor Malvisi. Four. Councillor Osborne. Four. Councillor Parker. Four. Councillor Ward. Four. Thank you. Councillor Brewster. Four. Councillor Byrne. Four. Councillor Flatman. Four. Councillor Fleming. Four. Councillor Gould. Four. Councillor Haddingham. Four. Councillor Morley. Four. Councillor Richardson. Four. Councillor Whitehead. Four. Thank you, Chair. That's unanimous. I'll just wait for Rob to confirm that we are no.